Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. And then we come in and the tech guys, you know, that are the company are passive aggressive. And it takes uh, a lot of time to to build up trust and say that we're not here to yeah, to replace you. Everyone's objective, every consultant's objective should be to bring in skills that are missing on the client side while capitalizing on the on the skills and the knowledge that the client has better than anyone else in the world. All right, let's talk building an IoT product or system. Time to cycle through concept to ideation to proof of concept to prototype to MVP and then finally to end product. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, part one of two, I speak with Yuri Priadko who shares his practical experience on the six-step journey to manufacturing or deployment. In part one, we laid a foundation using an interesting example of an IoT system in the fitness space, prepping us for episode two, where we quantify the process. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people... The business and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is for business leaders and managers employing the Internet of Things for their business or the business of their customers. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair, and I interview the industry's leading authorities to find out how they use IoT to improve business and create value. If you like this show, subscribe to it on iTunes and go to iotinc.com to check out my complimentary articles, videos, meetups, and webinars. This is episode three in our mini series on product pre production with IoT system integrators, product designers, or both. It's where we take all that theory from the last 30 odd episodes and we put into action by talking to the pros who've been there, done that, and got the t shirt. Well, after a very satisfying two day intensive workshop last week, I'm at it again. If you're interested in taking my one day workshop, I'll be putting it on in conjunction with our IoT Mega Meetup that we're having here in the Silicon Valley on January 13th, 2016. My meetup, along with the three other most active in the Bay Area, are combining forces in what we're calling the IoT Mega Meetup. We're going to have at least 300 attendees joining us that evening, so if you want to make a day of it, though, come early. Join me in the morning. By the end of the course, you'll have a very solid understanding of IoT tech and how to use it in your business to generate value. For more information, go to www.iot-inc.com slash training, where you'll get all the details. I'll also have a link to the course details and to meet up in the show analysis notes. So join us, and if you decide to register for the class, use my 33% discount code IOTPODCAST16, or IOTPODCAST16, all one word, all lowercase. With me today on episode 37 is Yuri Priatico. Yuri is Director of Customer Solutions at Cogniance, with experience spanning product and process design, hardware, and software development. Before his current position, Yuri led the project management office tailoring industry standard approaches to each customer's needs. I met Yuri at the Designer of Things conference a few weeks back, and I thought after talking to him, he'd be a great addition to the show. Yuri, welcome. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks for having me. So I saw your degree is in computer systems and networks. Wow. I mean, it sounds like that could be a degree in IoT tech. Uh, in fact, you are not very uh, far away from the truth. It was, uh, a, uh, you know, it was an engineering degree that spanned mm. both the, uh, the software part of, of those systems, but we also did a lot of work on the, uh, on the hardware part. In fact, uh, we, we did some amazing work uh, uh, it it was from uh, the, well, my degree was from the National Aviation University. Uh, you, mm-hmm. You've seen that, and we we yep. actually did some amazing work for the pretty old school analog uh, computers that were installed in the uh, in the airplanes back in the fifties and sixties that 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 we still had uh, in the labs. 
<laughs> so what do you mean? You you had the you had the radio systems in the labs that you were just playing around with, or you were talking about the radios in the planes themselves? I'm, I'm not talking about radios. I'm talking about the oh. analog computers that were used to got it. Uh, got uh, you know to to calculate the position of the plane, mm. etc. Okay, okay, and you were and you had those in the lab, or you were actually using the ones that were being used in the air? Oh uh, no, in the lab. I I, I actually okay. never. Uh, no one let me fiddle with the one that that was in in the air. For for good reasons, yeah, probably. <laughs> well, it kind of reminds me. I remember when I when I bought my first iPhone. We're talking the one with the curved black um, plastic back, you know. And that was like a long time ago. Uh-huh. And I and I think at that time they they were they were making the analogy between the computational power of the iPhone and the entire NASA computational power that it took to put a man on the on the moon in 1969. So um, I'm assuming there's some there's some there's some degree of uh, comp, uh, you know uh, similarity there. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Just in terms just in terms of the power you know that you're working with a very low uh, from the 50s. I would imagine that's well that's going to actually be obviously before <laughs> way before uh, the moon landing. So it's probably like not even the power of one of the chips or one of the sensor chips in the iPhone or something. Well, like that. if you're talking about MIPS, uh, of course, uh, right now we have immense power in our pockets. But analog systems, and this is actually very mm. relevant to IoT, mm-hmm. have mm. uh, you know have a lot of benefits when it comes to real time data processing. And when you have a, a plane, you know, f- flying in real time, and when you don't have powerful digital systems before they got sufficiently uh, powerful in order to be able to handle all the analog to digital uh, and back. Uh, actually, analogs uh, were much better suited to uh, uh, to handle uh, the tasks that that a typical plane would have. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, okay. And, and, but extrapolate on on that a little bit. Like, what is the characteristics of an analog system that'd be more beneficial than a than a weak digital one? I guess. Uh, so, a- analog system uh, deals with uh, uh, with the continuous. Uh, uh, continuous flow of information. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- there right. is, uh, there is, you know, uh, there is no uh, frequency uh, with, uh, uh, with 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 which uh, you uh, uh, you make the the signal discrete in order to to process it. Right, right. No sampling. No sampling. It, 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 exactly. Uh, there is no sampling involved. And right. uh, when when you are trying to control for. Uh, for you know i probably rapid changes i wanted to say small changes but rapid changes mm, mm, in, in mm. any variable uh, you're talking about uh for, for example when you're controlling the ailerons on on the plane and uh, and you're into in in turbulence for example mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, uh analog systems are much uh better uh in uh in immediately responding to uh to the to whatever conditions you throw at them as opposed to to a digital systems that are limited with with that sampling uh, frequency, uh, right. uh, you you remember that the sampling frequency has to be twice higher than the mm-hmm. frequency of the signal, at least twice higher than the frequency yeah. of the signal you're processing. Otherwise, you'll be losing information. Yeah, the Ninquist uh, frequency rate, I think, is mm-hmm. what it's called. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, it's a continuous system, and I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna ask you in a second about. Maybe you're going to go in the sensor area, but um, yeah, it's it's quicker. However, what you can do with an analog circuit um, is going to be less sophisticated. However, quicker. So if you're doing if you're doing things that are that are less sophisticated but need to do them quickly, then I imagine yeah, the analog kicking it back old school would work really well. Uh, sometimes yes, and uh, nowadays, if you fast forward to 2015, you still have mm-hmm. a lot of analog sensors that that you still need right. to capture. You know, they they are cheap, which is a big deal when you're talking about uh, you know hundreds of thousands of uh, mm. endpoint devices deployed in the field. Uh, mm. The the you know one cent cent versus two cents becomes a big deal. Well, aren't we talking, aren't all, I guess it depends on what your definition of sensor is, but aren't all sensors analog sensors? I mean, you are converting some energy into a DC current, or are you saying some of them are, are actually converting directly into digital? Uh, well, you, you, you're actually right. Uh, uh, all, all, of, you know, all of the sensors uh, will, will capture the, the analog signal first. And and then you will convert to then digital, the but right. the, the the conversion part also takes uh it takes energy, True. and uh you 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 have to do that. So if you're capturing analog values, and then then you're doing the uh the uh analog to digital conversion somewhere 
upstream well i i i don't really mm-hmm. i don't really see mm-hmm. uh see a use case where that can uh r- right right now right now we are in a digital world yeah we're definitely in a digital world well why don't we talk a little bit about yourself give us give us a little bit of background about yourself and um you know your history in iot uh yeah so uh my name is yuri predko and uh and I'm I'm one of the uh, founding members of of Cognience, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, what uh, what we do at Cognience uh, is we uh, as as you said when you when you did the great intro, thanks for that. Mm. <laughs> uh, is uh, is we specialize on on the end to end projects spanning both okay. design and development of 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 hardware and software. Uh, think of it as you know as as a combination of consulting and outsourcing. Right, figuring right. out uh, what to build, but also helping build it. And right. uh, since uh, since uh, I've been doing that for uh, for many years now, we will be turning uh, we will be turning ten next April. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, it 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 actually uh, allowed me to work with uh, with some of the uh, I'd say some of the greatest companies uh, in. Uh, in a number of uh, of markets, in a number of IoT markets, such as uh, mm. automotive, mm. Uh, such as connected health and fitness, uh, smart home automation and smart energy is another another big vertical for us. So I've mm. seen those products uh, being developed uh, on all of the life cycle stages, from from the from the back of the napkin sketch to the actual production deployment. And of course, I've seen uh, I've seen the highs and lows of uh, of what works and what doesn't, and uh, that's that's basically what uh, what I uh, want to share today. Yeah, no, I'm 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 looking forward to digging into it because that's exactly where we are right now. You know, in the podcast, we're in the middle of a mini series on working with on on dis, you know discussing the issues with system integrators and and, and or and or uh, product design houses and I like your perspective and when we were talking that's what I thought was really was really a good one your perspective on being able to take it I like like you said like back of the napkin all the way to production um, before we get into that though we know a little bit about you we know a little bit about your history but tell us something that we uh, that most people wouldn't know about you uh, let's see. Uh, you uh, you mentioned radios, right? When when I was talking about right. those analog computers, I I, yeah. I actually have a story from from my childhood. Okay. So I, I was uh, growing up uh, in Ukraine, which was mm-hmm. a part of Soviet Union at the time. Ah, and, okay. Uh, yeah. When I was probably seven, I don't remember exactly. I I decided to put together my first IoT product. Jeez, you're okay. okay I'm, I'm, right. I'm kidding. You, you may have won the you may have won the award. Here. I, I've talked to a lot of guests that they've like drawn back, and everyone could kind of say, "Oh yeah, I was an IoT because of this." But seven, all right, I got to hear this. All right. Well, it was not exactly an IoT. I'm kidding, but it, it no, was that, it was electrical. It was I was, tr- I was trying to put uh, put together a radio, okay. and and the supplies were scarce. We didn't have sure. radio shacks on every corner, right? Oh, uh, uh, so uh, I, I I actually <laughs> didn't have batteries, so I I decided to make one. I oh, I took okay. some zinc from the dead light bulb, uh, some copper wire for 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 another electrode. I may I uh, <laughs> stirred up my own electrolyte from the kitchen salt. I put it on in a jar, and I still remember as if it was yesterday the moment where I connect the voltmeter and the needle moves. <laughs> I felt okay. like I can, you know, I can do everything now. I can conquer the world. <laughs> so, so here I am. Uh, I'm helping my clients conquer the world with innovative products, and that's that's where it all started. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that, and it's and it's interesting because at, at age seven, the Soviet basic science is strong. I mean, if you're already understanding how to make batteries at age seven, I'm trying to think. You know, I don't remember myself, but I can think about my kids, but. I don't think they got into you know that that level of chemistry or physics, however you want to look at it, until a bit later. So that's uh, that's kudos to to the Russian or the Soviet, I should say, um, education system. Uh, the is. education is uh, was and still Science is very education. STEM focused. Yeah. So right, right. you you cannot get a liberal arts degree without taking <laughs> a little bit of calculus, a little bit. <laughs> That's interesting, though. I don't know how I'd play. Although, yeah, maybe I. Uh, I mean, you you don't have to be, you know, go all the way. Uh, but you a little bit of calculus never hurt anybody, though. Exactly. Right? That, <laughs> even a pole. Exactly. 
you know, world would be better if every single if person would, would, would know a little bit of calculus. You know what? I think I agree with that, actually. <laughs> but just, just try telling that to my daughter. But anyway. <laughs> All right. So what type of projects? So, so you've said some of the industries, um, automotive, um, connected homes. But give us uh, just to frame things uh, for listeners. What type of IoT projects do you normally work on or have you worked on? Or what's, what's the focus now? Uh, so we work on, uh, on, a, on a range of, of products. We usually, it, uh, we usually serve two big uh, customer segments. Uh, it's uh, either startups who come come with us, yep. uh, come come with an idea, come to us with an idea, and they uh, they seek help to to bring that idea to the market. Uh, mm-hmm. Or uh, it can be innovation labs of bigger companies. So we have Xerox as a client, we have Panasonic as a client, right? And and those mm-hmm. big folks uh, have uh, their their production of uh, mm, uh, facilities and and the departments that are focused on uh of course on the efficiency and on bringing uh, you know on on the manufacturing etc but they sure. also have internal uh innovation labs which are structured not unlike startups mm-hmm. uh that uh that really work on on the new groundbreaking stuff that will uh eventually in a couple of years trickle down uh, to to the uh, to the market uh, to the products that that the uh, company will be making so we, we would work with with those innovation labs but uh, the uh, the specifics of working uh, with a bigger company as opposed to a startup is startups usually uh, start from blank slate you you, uh, you know you you design the product from scratch uh, you 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 try to come up with with something something new right as opposed right. to a big company that may have uh, legacy systems, uh, may have previous generations of the product, and that uh, that changes the way you approach problems because you have to make sure that you uh, enable backwards compatibility with whatever infrastructure they're having. You you make sure that you deliver uh, products that uh, that 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 will work in uh, you know sometimes in deprecated environments, but still mm-hmm. you want to make sure that they you know uh, if if the environment is from the eighties, you still do not have any right to design a product that will look like something from the eighties. You still need right. to to design for a modern user, for a modern uh, uh, consumer, or you know or a B- business user if we're talking B two B, but. Uh, uh, they, uh, the, the expectations are really high from the user side right now. The bar is set really high. Right, right. No, I mean, I think from a UX point of view, you're definitely right. But in the back end, you're going to have to tap into whatever you have to tap into. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, in, so now with uh, Innovation Labs, is this, is this a common theme that you're finding? Is there actually – do you have enough samples – to say that innovation labs that I mean I guess I just haven't worked for a big company in a long time now it's been probably since Microsoft um, is this a common structure within these larger companies or is it just happens to be the ones that you've you've touched on or the ones that you were dealing with uh, well be maybe maybe uh, maybe there is a selection bias of course maybe mm-hmm. we are working with the companies that uh, happen to have those innovation labs but mm-hmm. I would say uh, more and more of of the big corporations uh, start to understand that that the rigid uh, formal structure doesn't lend itself uh, to right. uh, to innovation. And in order to enable innovation, you you know you need to lose the tie. You need to you know uh, you know all the uh, you know the, the, some sometimes uh, it's 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 interesting. Uh, I uh, uh, I've been to Japan this summer. Mm-hmm. And uh, they they have a very strong, very rigid corporate structure, and yeah. uh, they also try to play this game. They try to play Silicon Valley. Uh, they uh, on Fridays is it dressed down Fridays that you uh, mean? Or no, they, 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 they do have uh, they do have uh, uh, incubators, as they say, and right. accelerator startup accelerators. Sure. I've been to to an uh, IoT startup accelerator at uh, KDDI and ABBA Labs. Mm-hmm. Which was a big boys' playground, which was millions right. of equipment crammed into a pre-limited space, and you know it was all up for grabs. Just you know, uh, nice. dear startups, please come in and use this in order to do right. something. But when I asked, uh, okay, this this is like production grade, high end stuff. Uh, how how do startups do it? 
uh, they, 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 they didn't have a good answer. So it seemed to me that they, you know, they, they created, you know, this no, no tie dress code, you know, come to work in yeah. jeans and, and t-shirts. Right. Right. And they bought a lot of, uh, you know, expensive uh, 3D printers and uh, CNC machines. But they, uh, they don't really have, uh, uh, they, they don't really know what to do with it. It, it, it takes right. more than, than just, uh, uh, you know, uh, stating that you want to do innovative and sure. do something, uh, something great. It takes process and it also takes right kind of mindset, right kind of people. And yeah. uh, I'd, I'd say the the companies that re- reali- uh, the the corporations that have realized it in time and now is time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. They uh, they uh, uh, they they would enable uh, the right people uh, to you know they, they I'd say they would shield the right people from uh, from some of the bureaucracy that inevitably happens in in larger organizations in some more than the in the others. No, and I and I think you know what you're what you're you're identifying is cultural. And even if you do protect and you know you put them in in their playground, and you tell them to wear whatever, um, still it's really difficult to change culture of people. And that's why often you'll see. And I think it first started happening with the with the automotive companies where they would they'd realize this. You know, I think one of the biggest strengths is to realize your weaknesses mm-hmm. and. And so they would open offices in California. And I remember this was happening around 20 years ago when I was in the CAD industry. And we were starting to visit these offices of Toyota, of Nissan, you know, in, in Southern California, you know, near, um, near the art school, you know, Cal- the, the California art mm-hmm. schools that are, that are down there. So um, that's interesting. And so are you working with companies? Are they in the United States, or you, you said you were in Japan, So, but are you actually working with them based in other countries too, or is it mostly more local? Uh, we are actually global. Uh, we, have, okay. uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, presence in, in Europe. We have a lot of uh, our manpower actually in Europe, in, in Denmark, mm. Uh, mm. Uh, in Germany, uh, in, uh, which, and, and the German uh, office is very much focused on automotive, as you can imagine. Yes. Uh, okay. We have Poland, we have Ukraine, where I come from. Uh, so we, we do not have, uh, you know, uh, office on the ground in Japan, but we do work with, with the Japanese companies. Interestingly, okay. uh, people, who, uh, <clears throat> people who want to, uh, uh, to, 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 to not miss the train, I would say, mm-hmm. uh, they, uh, and uh, especially corporations, the big ones that, that want to, uh, you know, that, that, that have, you know, larger budgets than, than someone, than anyone else, basically, they, they tend to open up uh, offices in, in Silicon Valley bec- because right. of the access to talent, because of the access to, to the infrastructure, you know, just, just when, yeah. when you breathe this air, mm. uh, it's rarefied. Yeah. yeah it's, it, you know, it, it changes, <laughs> ch- changes your thinking, but uh, it, air is not enough. What is very important what is paramount in uh, new product development is having the right process. If, if right. you've never done something before, chances are you will not do it right from the first time. Do you remember uh, how, 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 what, how, how did the first time riding a bicycle feel? Yeah. Well, I, 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 don't, I, I, I remember falling a lot. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I do remember my falls, and it involved a fence, <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't involve brakes. <laughs> Never a good combination. In fact, I remember once I had uh, I had built myself a chopper bike. So that's the bikes with the long front end with the wheels far in advance. Uh-huh. And I would, for some reason, always want to take off, take my hands off the off the handlebars. And one time I did that and went right into a tree. So I wasn't a fence, but I was a tree. And I do. <laughs> I do that counts, remember. Bruce. That counts. That counts. So yeah. So you bring up a good point. Um, the innovation labs, and you know what I've seen is really three structures when you're working within larger companies. You have the startup structure, and I think this is uh, you know the analogy here is is the innovation labs. You've got a center of excellence, you know, which can work, and then you've got more of an advisory committee that's kind of like a consulting group within the organization. But I always, when I when I do my workshops and when I do visit these large companies, I'm always promoting. Um, the startup mentality, which I guess is what you're saying, is this is this innovative lab, innovation lab? Then exactly, it's like a yeah. startup within a larger organization. Being able to yeah. tap into the talent pool, being able to tap into bigger organization resources, but not constrained 
by the uh, by the bigger organization uh, limitations. Yeah, and specifically the quarterly numbers and, and having to you know, yeah, to make this, uh, not yeah. having to uh, to turn in you know the specific number at you know at, at the end of every month. You know, quarterly is uh, is you know not that bad. <laughs> Yeah, cor- yeah, that's true. You got monthly quotas as well. But <clears throat> okay, so I want to go back to the projects though. So again, give us some examples so we can so we can just understand where you're coming from. Give us some examples of some recent IoT uh projects that you've been that you've been working on. <sighs> A couple actually. Uh so um, to give you uh um, okay, I'll give you an example from uh from the uh, from the connected health and fitness field, okay. and that yep. that is actually a very uh, very good uh, example because it spans much more than uh, than the uh, devices that would talk you know to, sure. to to the cloud, but also the cloud infrastructure, but also the mobile apps, but also the third party integrations, which are which are uh-huh. paramount uh, right now. Let's hear it. So the the company uh, is called NetPulse. They're based up mm-hmm. here in San Francisco. Okay, uh, Pet Pulse, yeah. Uh-huh. I like it. I like the name already. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, what they're doing is they provide uh, backend infrastructure uh, for, uh, and, and also uh, not, not only backend, just infrastructure uh, for the fitness clubs around the ah, world. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you will okay. never see if you walk into, into a, you know, a major fitness chain and they have all the major fitness chains as their clients. If you walk mm. into, uh, into a major fitness chain, uh, you will see, uh, you know, uh, a nice screen on uh, on your uh, treadmill that right. that would allow you to log in with your, you know, cl- club provisioned, uh, uh, I, you know, user handle identity. Uh, mm-hmm. identity. Yes, and it will allow it will allow you to uh, to record all of your workouts, uh, track all the data, send you know the data as mm-hmm. you go mm-hmm. to to the mm-hmm. cloud for you know for to to collect statistics, to analyze it, etc. But it will never be branded NetPulse. You will never see the name. It will be okay. branded. Uh, with the respective uh, mm-hmm. gym's name, and uh, right. and you will have a gym app on your phone that that will allow you to to access that data and log in and you know see the schedules and and everything all the all the collateral services that you would need. But the core the core val- offering the core value of of Netballs that they deliver is that they enable uh, the fitness clubs to capture. Uh, more data about the uh, user, about their fitness routine, uh, than mm-hmm. uh, than anyone possibly can. They capture okay. all the data uh, within the the fitness club by uh, by having the uh, by by controlling uh, all all of the firmware that that goes into the machine and by controlling all of the uh, data transfer back to the cloud and the cloud infrastructure for the analytics. But what they also do is they integrate with uh, third-party uh, data sources such as Fitbits, mm-hmm. such as mm-hmm. you know MyFitnessPal, mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, you know uh, the rest of the fitness apps and trackers. They have you know several tens of uh, of integrations on the list in order to create uh, the network effect, in order to create uh, the end-to-end uh, picture of of the uh, of the users fitness profile their preferences mm-hmm. and then based on that information when you when you have that that uh you know high level visibility with the very granular uh data that that come in every day even when you don't go to the gym on that particular day you uh you you start to be able to enable uh a number of use cases both on the analytics side both for the user and for the uh for the sports club but also okay. gamification experiences, but also advertisement experiences, uh, <laughs> but also okay. uh, you know a number of uh, of value added services that you can deliver to the user by knowing more by by having this this uh, you know net cast wide that, that that grabs all the fitness data information uh, about the user. Uh, you, you you're able to to deliver extra value to uh, to the end client and uh, of course by association since you're enabling your sport club to to deliver that they're a b two b company so sport sport clubs love them for mm-hmm. for, for those sure. capabilities that would be okay. an example of uh, 
uh, of a project where where we we would be responsible uh, for the uh, for the implementation on all of these stages. We help them uh, do the embedded engineering on the on the fitness machines themselves. We we help them with the mobile app. We help them with the device to cloud connectivity and the uh, the big data backend uh, uh, be behind uh, behind all those uh, all those yep. data collection and processing. Uh, I, I, I think that's that's a very a very good high level uh, overview of of what we are capable of doing. So this is interesting. So you're saying that they're getting access to the embedded systems within each of the you know each of the different Nor um, Nordica or Nautica, for example. They can actually access the firmware within different manufacturers' machines. And or and or how does that yeah, work? Yeah, and and Life Fitness. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah, they uh, actually their their VP of product uh, when when we were launching this, he used to spend like. Uh, Probably uh, three weeks uh, in a month at uh, uh, at Life Fitness's office, uh, okay. talking to them okay. about about the integrations, uh, making sure that interfacing with them. Yeah, exactly. Making sure that we are reading all their hardware inputs right, and uh, it was. Uh, I, I'd say in general, I, I can generalize this experience. Third party integrations uh, are uh, are a big deal. Uh, yeah, and no, they it, they can be both the power uh, that you have uh, to in order to create those network effects I was talking about uh, to draw information beyond your reach. Right. If you cannot uh, if you cannot plant a sensor uh, somewhere, if you cannot you know uh, if you cannot uh, uh, get a temperature uh, from uh, from a certain point in your home if you're doing a smartphone system, how can you infer that information? Can you use uh, lighting? As uh, uh, as a good proxy for the temperature, will will the mm. sun uh, heat this this place up? You need to look mm. beyond beyond what's reachable to you in order to to get the information that you need. And in order to yeah. do that, you need to understand what you're trying to accomplish first. And then uh, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes IoT products I see in the market are are solutions looking for a problem. You've got this, uh, you know, uh, you know wearables are you know dime a dozen right now. Uh, wearables don't do much except for capturing, you know, your uh, your activity data. All the value is is in the cloud. All the value is how do you deal with that information? Right, right. No, and and I think you know, I I kind of told you my philosophy when we met a couple of weeks back. In that, you know, there's connected products, there's smart products, but they're not they're not Internet of Things products. And the difference is is part of it is what you're talking about here, and then being able to bring the bear the power and yeah i remember um, that conversation mm -hmm. yeah yeah and you know the other thing i think for our listeners that that you're is pointing out which is an important one is often with the internet of things people are considering the sense the sensors as being the only data source and that can't be any further from the truth and uh, the truth and one way to access other data sources is through data services and they can be accessed i should say with an api for example or some sdk but it's going to be these data services that are available plus the sensor data that's going to give you this this data that you need because like you said what you should be doing is planning what is it you're trying to do so what information am i trying to produce and that'll drive what data i need to get that may be captured by sensors but often that'll be captured by by data services right and you don't have to build that uh, data capture pipeline at no. all that's right well meaning you can just interface with it through an api mm -hmm. or some other yes. service yeah and i think this is another you know some people if you think about it a little bit this is what the power of the Internet of Things is, is digitizing the thing in a way that can interface with the Internet. And the power of the Internet, you know, if we compare it with the time when I was a programmer, which is now many years ago, well, geez, I mean, I love programming and I, and I still and I still would love to do it and have the time to do it. It was it was probably my my favorite job. I'm with you. However, I'm with you, Bruce. However, you know, I was building stuff almost at the atomic level. We had a few libraries. I was in the graphics area, so we had, you know, graphic libraries, a few of them. But often I'd be, I'd be doing the low-level libraries. Now, you know, when programmers come out, they have such power. You know, the mobile apps that you can create, there's such power that, that's available. Why? Because of the same reason, right? That you can tap into all these services that are on the, inter that are on the Internet. And that is, you know, that is an, maybe an unspoken but an actual very – powerful component of what of what iot is what do you think i i believe uh uh 
it it must be uh, it must be Bill Gates who said that once, uh, and it perfectly summarizes that the biggest trick in software is using a piece of software that has already been written. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a term for that. It's not reusability, but but no, and that's exactly it. And and I think the difference when Bill Gates was programming. Um, and then today is the magnitude of that software and then the access of what you can get to it with the interfaces that are available today. The abstraction of the interfaces is just so much more powerful because it used to be almost like when you wanted to access these these external libraries. And in my day, it was libraries because it was more local. But now it's services because it's it's not local. Yeah, microservices. Was, microservices. I mean, it was complicated back then because – Almost just learning the APIs, I mean, just learning all the calls was was an education in itself. And now it's been abstracted to the point um, that that it, it's a lot, it seems anyway, you know, not that I'm rolling up my sleeves any longer, but it seems that it's it's far simpler to do this interfacing. And beyond that, what you're interfacing to is so much more powerful because now it's on the Internet, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And by by simplifying the access to the data, by simplifying mm-hmm. the access to, uh, to the uh, – you know, to the uh, services, to those microservices we are talking about, we are enabling uh, more people. We are enabling uh, uh, more uh, use cases uh, to 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 actually. W- we're enabling more people to work with that data. Uh, to to give you an That's example, right. uh, uh, I I know a, a bunch of data scientists who are you know who are not big fans of uh, of writing code. They they, okay. they are much more comfortable. I mean, they 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 do write code since they they mm-hmm. they, they have to, but mm-hmm. they they are much more comfortable on the conceptual level as opposed to uh, to actually going and implementing uh, the the algorithm that they they've devised. Not prototyping, mm-hmm. but actually making mm-hmm. sure that it it is efficient, uh, it is production grade, it it's covered with unit tests. They 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 mm-hmm. don't they don't want to worry too much about uh, about the engineering uh, part of the job. And okay. providing them the the high level interfaces, providing them with the API, uh, you know, if 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 you have uh, if you have the uh, you know, for example, we are, we're talking about we were talking about sensors. If you are mm. providing, uh, uh, if your network, uh, the deployed network of sensors provides, uh, uh, you know, a RESTful API that That's that it. will allow anyone to pull that data in you know in read mode and do whatever they want with them in in real time it means that uh the uh for for that data scientist pulling the data from the database or pulling the data from the field becomes uh you know essentially the same task right right no and and uh, and that's exactly it and and when i speak to to my clients or my students when I'm doing my workshops, it's this, it is this access to the data. And in the old days with, the, and the old days, I guess still the, the today days, but when you're choosing your sensors and the environment for your sensors, you want to get away from having to know how the data was collected. You don't want to know that, you know, temperature is in you know, registry number 1562, uh, you know, two DNRA and then slash, you know, 5215. You want to have it abstracted, like you said, with just with a get and a put. And there, and that has a lot of implications, not only on the development environment, but also on the application protocols, utilizing some sort of application protocols that these development environments can access so they can contextualize that information. And so this is, you know, you, 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 you touched on a very important point in terms of efficiency um, in, a, in a lot of different dimensions. And that is, in, and I guess it really comes down to this abstraction, what we're talking about is an abstraction of data. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. I want to get back to this. Um, so it's interesting, but we're a business show here. So with regard to the fitness example, I, I get the system and it's an, an and it's a sexy system. But what I want to know is what was the value that they're pulling out of it? I, I mean, I almost thought I heard you say like they're going to be sending me ads when I'm on my machine and I was shuddering at that thought. But what is the extra, what is the value that they're trying to produce with their, with their IOT uh, fitness system? Oh, uh, huge. Uh, is that a, but just measuring is not interesting, <laughs> right? So, and, and I think you've identified that with quantify yeah. itself. Yeah, uh, quantify itself is 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 one one aspect. But for the uh, for the club itself, you can mm. uh, predict by uh, and this this is the data they came in to mm. us. You know, when we were mm. scoping this out, when we were in the discovery phase and the first workshops, mm. we asked them, okay, 
you're going to you you want us to build this uh you know huge thing for you why do you need it and uh i remember uh uh, they them giving me a very specific example by yep. simply collecting and knowing uh, the check ins to the club, the data at the at the tourniquet on the entrance, mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. where you where you check yep. in with your card. Yep. By by knowing and analyzing that, you can predict with like ninety percent uh, accuracy almost uh, when when the user is going to quit. Interesting. So if you if you go, I like that. I like that. I like that. That's not what I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say when they're going to come back, but that is not near as interesting as when they're going to quit. Obviously, for the specifically uh, for the clubs. Absolutely, absolutely. Or even for even for the athlete or for the the person working out. So for the athlete, there is another and and uh, to 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 go uh, to to finish up that case. Uh, mm-hmm. If if you know in advance that the user have started training less intensely. You know, chances are they uh, they they were not feeling well, and uh, it's an opportunity for the trainer to to reconnect with the user, drop them an email, and say, "Hey, right. uh, Mike, how are you? I I can see you 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 were you know uh, you were not as strenuous as 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 usual. What what happened? It, are, right. are you just taking or, it? Or maybe you're not even showing up as frequently, right? But not showing up as frequently is a great leading indicator into dropping mm. the club membership. And right, uh, right. sometimes all it takes is is just an email uh, saying hello. We haven't seen you for a while. Did you know that that the health benefits of working out at least once per week per week are this, this, and this, and this? Yeah, no, I like that, and I think that is valuable. And you brought up a good one, or the and you know they identified. And I would think even to you know with respect to churn and the cost of acquiring a new customer, I would think that it even be a value to them to say, hey, um, hey, Mike. You know, we we've seen you've, you know, you haven't been coming as frequently, or maybe you're only bench pressing 150 pounds these days. Um, but how would you like a free uh, personal trainer? You know, how would you like a, a session with a, a free session with a personal trainer? And that might be something that you know. I'm just thinking out loud here, but that might be something that would get them going back to the gym and then maybe reignite and then not quit, which is you know, which is really I think you know what the gym's uh, uh, perspective from the gym's perspective is. You you are hitting a very good point which is personalized insights that are usually historically were provided by personal trainers uh, is what people are after. Uh, I, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of working with a personal trainer myself. I, I prefer that to, to just going in and, and doing whatever I, I feel like doing today. Uh, but uh, think of, uh, you know, having collected uh, millions of and billions of data points about uh, the uh, the specific exercise pro- programs users had and the effect that exercise program had on their endurance had had on their you know heart rate uh, when they run f- 5k or uh, you know on the uh, on the you know way they can bench press interesting i'm liking this yeah because they're collecting that pre workout data yes and and post and and during the workout and then yeah, and, right and, right, and, that's and, right. And the, but they're doing that correlation i think is the point yes, right they're correlating and, and then, the pre with the po- with the performance mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then you can devise the uh, and, and this this where the data science comes in. You can devise the relationships that that were not evident before that you can automate. Instead of saying, "Hey, uh, Mike," or "Hey, uh, Jane," go and uh, work with a personal trainer and throw in uh, the the session that would cost uh, you, you know, 150 bucks, right? Maybe less if you're considering the cost base of it. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, Instead of doing that, you can spend, uh, you know, five, five cents, uh, you know, when you amortize the cost of the initial research over, over the amount of times you do that and say, hey, Mike, uh, here's, uh, here's what we think will, will get you back to speed. And we present them the information that is based on, you know, uh, you know, 10, uh, 10 hundred thousand, uh, people people's data, yeah, data yeah. that yeah. are exactly like mike they, they are. and trying to achieve the same goals potentially yes, they, they they don't want to you know to bulk up instead they want to uh make sure right. they lose uh, you know they perform yeah, they, they or... lose weight and they perform aerobically on on higher distances because they for example they're training for the marathon right 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 yeah no i mean and this reminds me i mean i've um my first iron man so i've done a number of iron man's my first iron man 
um, I had a coach and part of it, this is when I was all hooked up with the Garmin, I'd upload my data and he'd be looking at fatigue specifically and seeing, you know, he'd be adjusting the workouts, the, the weekly workouts, the daily workouts mm-hmm. based on fatigue because he could see performance, but then he would, but this is where analytics takes the place of the coach is, but he could see the curves and relate the, the changes them to, to fatigue and then realize that, you know, you maybe need to pull back on the workouts as opposed to continue pushing forward because ultimately he's, he was looking at data, but he was the, you know, my coach was that interpreter. I liked the idea of being able to, and I'm trying to think, yeah, I was, I think I was spending $150 a month. Uh, maybe it was, yeah, I think it was 200, maybe $200 a month with the coach, but sure be nice to get that as part of my gym membership. That's for And sure. that's, that's exactly what Net, NetPulse is enabling uh, its customers to allow the uh, gyms to, to provide this as a service. And now you said that you had Garmin, you had this data upload yeah. routine, yeah. you were, yeah. you were all, all yeah, you know, you, you, you spent some time on, on making sure oh, yeah. you, uh, oh, yeah. you, you do this uh, ETL. Yeah, ingest process. Yeah, that's right. I, I was doing the extraction <laughs> transfer and load. Yes, that's uh, translate and load. I was doing that personally. Yeah, and uh, imagine uh, your workout <laughs> machine, your treadmill doing that for you. Imagine your yeah. exercise bike doing that for you. Right. No, I like it. Okay, well, that was great, Yuri. Thank you. That was a great part one. Um, before we before we sign off, and we are going to do a part two on this, before we sign off, where can our audience find out more about you and, and your company? Uh, well, I, I've given a lot of examples from, from real life, so I, I don't think I need to go further uh, about company. You can go to Cogniance.com for, for more information about what we do and, uh, and some of the examples that I've already used. Uh, of, as, as of me, uh, you can always reach me uh, on Twitter. Uh, you can always uh, email me for, for any kind of advice uh, or, you know, just to, just to pick my brain on the, uh, on the next IoT product that, that you're envisioning or, uh, or anything beyond that that I can help with. I'll be happy to help. Excellent. Well, we'll talk to you uh, in part two. Thanks, Bruce. Well, stay tuned for next episode when I talk with Yuri on quantifying both the cost and the time for doing projects like the gym project and a whole bunch of other questions I think you're going to find uh, really useful. Okay, well, that was episode number 37. For a summary, links, and all the valuable resources, just go to the show analysis notes. They can all be found in one place. Just go to iot-inc.com slash podcasts. And you'll see them all there. Well, now I could use your help. We're trying to get this show off the ground. And the best way to get discovered is with iTunes. So if you've enjoyed the episode or found it informative, I'd really appreciate a review. All you have to do is go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. And that'll redirect you to our iTunes page where you can let people know what you think by simply giving this show a star review or leaving a comment. I'd really appreciate that. If you'd like to learn more about the business of the Internet of Things, visit my media site. It can be found at iot-inc.com. There you'll find other podcasts as well as articles, videos, and information about upcoming live events like my stream meetups and webinars. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thanks for listening. Until next time, may your path to IoT business be a six-stepped one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 